recording there we are lovely so we can uh, upload this to youtube later for those that uh, don't miss uh, that, that can't make this to today okay fab still a few more of you arriving so we'll just uh, hold fire for a second so yes so i was saying uh, paramedic practitioner i've got a special interest in anything to do with ecgs and cardiology in general so uh, hopefully as we go through this i can answer any questions um you have Fabulous. Thanks, Matt. You obviously spotted we weren't recording either. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, so it's a few minutes past seven, so we will get going. So um, we want these um, webinar series to be um, as interactive as possible. So, folks, let's make it really interactive tonight. So loads of ways to get in touch with us. So uh, as you can see already, uh, STC admin is up in the, the chat ready to reply to you. If you've got any technical problems, anything you want to ask us then feel free to um, fire comments into the chat there and uh, uh, Charlotte on uh, admin will be able to uh, help you out there. Um, so tonight we're going to try, we've got WhatsApp, you can uh, WhatsApp message us um, uh, anything you want within reason. <laughs> 07535 um, and we have access to that so I'll keep an eye on that as we go through for any questions you have that you don't want to fire into the chat. Um, you can also tweet us as we go along. We've got the Twitter feed up at STC Training Limited uh, LTD if you want to um, tweet us. And as always, uh, webinars at stctrainingsolutions.co.uk for anything to do with these webinars, whether you want to suggest future material or whether you want to ask any questions uh, after we finish this evening. So we're going to use Mentimeter again uh, this evening. We trialled it last week. Um, we've improved how that integrates with the, the slides, so hopefully it'll be a bit more of a smooth uh, interface tonight so uh, make sure you've got your smartphones available so we're going to use Mentimeter go to menti.com and pop in the code when prompted and uh, we can have some live Q&A uh, a little bit later on so um, those of you that were along last week we did some of the real fundamentals of ECGs um, and some of it was a little bit in depth uh, around biochem so you'd be pleased to know that from now on we're just really going to be talking about how we read ECGs a little bit of pathophys behind um, what some of the rhythms are and, and how they uh, how they come about. So, so tonight we're just going to refresh on the individual waves that we discussed uh, last time. Um, look at what normal sinus rhythm is. There's nothing truly normal, I'm, I suppose, but uh, but what we class as NSR, normal sinus rhythm, we'll look at that. Some basic arrhythmias and, and just some tools to help you um, decode what's going on when, when you see an arrhythmia. Um, we're going to talk about atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation because they're quite common rhythms that you'll you'll see and about, particularly atrial fibrillation. Um, AV blocks, actually really quite straightforward when you look at them, but uh, they do confuse people. So we'll go through those. Cardiac arrest rhythms, you can't really do lead to without uh, without talking about cardiac arrest rhythms um, for those of you that, that haven't seen that too often. And obviously the Q&A session at the end will be guided by you so we can talk about whatever subjects you want um uh, on this obviously if it's going to be covered in a future session then we may hold off and just uh, wait until we can do the actual webinar on that so how are we doing for numbers good so great to see so many of you again thank you and uh, we'll get going then in that case so um you'll remember this slide from last week hopefully so um ecg waves just a quick refresher of what everything is so working along from the left um the p wave p wave is atrial contraction um as you can see there it's it's generally a, a positive wave when we're looking in lead two that's a good thing the uh, the qrs complex is the next big thing you're going to see you don't really want to see too many q waves but we'll talk about q waves in a bit more detail in a future webinar when we talk about um, acute coronary syndromes and mis and things like that but the qrs complex is is ventricular um depolarization that's the the the, the bulk of the heartbeat if you like so the atrial kick is the p wave the ventricular contraction is the qrs complex the J point where, where the S wave becomes a T wave is, is important when we talk about MIs. Again, that, that lecture is coming up and the T wave is uh, repolarization of the ventricles. As you see there should predominantly be upright in, uh, in a normal lead to rhythm. We talked very briefly about the U wave um, last week. The U wave is put in this diagram just, uh, just so you're aware that they do exist generally in, in um, potassium disturbances you'll see u waves and and bradycardias but we'll talk about that again in a future lecture because it's not particularly well understood um qt interval is quite important we're going to talk about that a little bit later but again there is a whole lecture coming up on t waves as well It'll be after the uh, after our little lecture on non mis i should imagine because the t waves can tell you quite a lot about your patient um 
particularly QT intervals and, and the directions they're traveling. So uh, PR segment we're going to talk a lot about tonight. PR segment is where you decipher what type of block, uh, AV block um, you have. And QRS duration is, is to deal with the bundle branch blocks, which we're going to talk about um, next week, actually. So we'll talk at the end about what we're going to cover next week. And the ST segment, as I say, is, is important in, in acute coronary syndromes and things along that line. And the RR interval is, is what we use to calculate rate, if you remember that from last week. So, fabulous. So let's get into something new then. So normal sinus rhythm, what we would call normal sinus rhythm, I, I, the purists out there are going to say, well, nothing's ever truly normal and you're, you're absolutely right, you know, but, but what the book says is normal um, is made up of six rules. Okay, so first, yeah, the most important, is it regular? It can't, be, it can't be normal sinus rhythm if it's not regular. So we've got a rhythm here. The way we're going to decide whether, whether a rhythm is regular is by, by counting the squares effectively between the RR waves or the RR intervals. Um, with practice, you'll get to very quickly see whether a rhythm is regular or not. And, and this rhythm here is nice and regular. Is the rate between 60 and 100? So uh, if you remember that we, um, we gave you a little formula for calculating that very basically. So if you divide 300 by the number of big squares, um, you're going to end up with, um, with a rough approximation of, of, of your heart rate in, in a regular rhythm. Um, so this, this rhythm here calculates out to about 75 beats per minute. So it is between 60 and 100. So uh, it's regular, it's between 60 and 100. We're going in the right direction. So P to QRS ratio of one to one, all that basically means is, is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Is there only one P wave as well? If you have too many Ps, um, then uh, you're going to have some sort of block, which we'll talk about later. So, so one P wave to one QRS complex, which we see there. So in each of these rhythms, where's my mouse gone? So just down here, you see a P, QRS, and a T wave, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T. This is, this is looking like it's going to be a normal sun. So your PR interval, which, we, uh, which is the, the conduction delay in the atrioventricular node, when, when the SA node fires and, and the, the current comes down the internodal pathways, which is your P wave, uh, it's held on to at the, at the uh, AV node for a little while just to allow the ventricles to pre-fill before they, they go off and contract. So we're looking for a nice constant, and that's important, a nice constant PR interval of between 120 and 200 milliseconds. That's three to five squares. Um, so I make that about four squares. So from, from the start of your P wave to the start of your R wave is, is three and a half to four squares. So we're, so we're pretty much bang in the middle of that. So we're quite happy that this PR interval is normal. And if you look at each of them in this rhythm strip here, you can see that they are constant. So this is looking good. QRS duration of less than 120 milliseconds, that basically means just a nice narrow uh, QRS complex. We don't have to worry too much about the, what's called the amplitude, i.e. the voltage, how high the, the R waves are, or how deep the S waves are, particularly at this point. Um, just note whether they're, they're narrow or wide. So a narrow QRS means it probably has come from the AV node and down the bundle of HIS the way it's supposed to. If it's wide, it, it may be that actually the, this rhythm has, gener has, has originated from somewhere more distally within the Hispokinji system and, and actually that would be abnormal so a wide QRS is, is abnormal in some way and your QTC direction uh, duration sorry so QTC remember was was the QT interval corrected for rate um, and we, we are going to talk about this in a lot more detail but uh, for the moment uh, when we're talking about normal sinus rhythm we're basically looking for a QT so from from where the Q wave would be there isn't a Q wave on, on this on this uh, ECG rhythm strip we have here which is good don't generally want the CQ wave. So, so we're going to take the QRS complexes effectively starting from the start of the R wave, which is the upward stroke. So from there to the end of the T wave, you want that to be less than about 450 milliseconds. We will go into more detail about why that's important. Um, so uh, as far as I can see, this is a, a normal sinus rhythm. If, if you were going to write this down on a bit of paper, you've done a four lead ECG and you're going to clock what you've found. Um, it's just going to, this is an SR for, for all intents and purposes. So again, the purists out there are going to say we can't say it's definitely come from a from a sinoatrial node unless we have more views of the P wave. Um, but we are we are going to talk about P waves in, in a lot more detail in future. So just for this evening, bear in mind, provided your P wave is, is positive in lead two and, and it meets all the other the other aspects here, the chances are it probably is a normal sinus rhythm. So Feb, so we've dealt with normal. Hopefully uh, that's just a, a refresher for most people rather than anything um, overly new. Um, so I meant to say a little bit earlier, if, if there are any questions, folks, rather than waiting for pauses and me saying, are there any questions? Because then we, we sit in silence until people type. If you've got questions, just throw them in the chat. 
um, and um, we'll cover them when, when we get to kind of a natural pause. So if there are any questions, please feel free to, to pop them in there. Um, and then we'll go on to um, abnormal because that's most patients. Um, can't see anything coming up in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it though, so feel free. Any questions that come up, throw them in. So we've got some, so 10 rules effectively for diagnosing um, arrhythmias or for helping you not necessarily diagnose, but making head nor tail of, of some arrhythmias. And, and we're, only, we're only going to talk about a few of these things tonight because it was just a basic introduction to um, arrhythmias that, that we're going to have this evening. So in general, so a couple of repetitive bits here. So in general, is it fast or slow? Um, is it regular? Now, a couple of terms you, you're going to use quite a bit when you're talking about ECGs is whether they are, when, when they're irregular, there's two types of irregular. So there's regularly irregular and irregularly irregular. Now, hope, hopefully I can, I can shed some light on what that means. So regularly irregular is basically any, any uh, where, where you sit down and you feel the patient's pulse and, and it seems to miss a beat or, or you feel that it's, it's not regular, basically. Um, but, but when you look at the ECG or when you look at even just your two lead, you see some kind of pattern to that irregularity. Um, hopefully it'll make sense in a couple of slides time. We'll talk about um, some, some, uh, um, some versions of a regularly irregular rhythm um, and you'll see loads as this series goes on. Um, irregularly irregular is is basically where there's absolutely no coordination and and actually uh, thankfully there are only three rhythms out there that you can that you can diagnose that are there are irregularly irregular so so it is it is um, one of the the easier rhythms to diagnose because you, you only have basically well, well we'll talk about that in a few minutes but basically you've only got to look for one thing to, to make the differential between them so um, so is, is your rhythm regular? Is it regularly irregular? You, can you see some, some patterns to the QRS complexes um, or, or is it just totally shambolic and all over the place? Fab. Um, you're going to look down at your P waves. So are they there first of all? That's going to help you make some diagnoses or differentials between, between what you're potentially seeing on the screen. We've got no P waves. Um, we're, we're going to be looking at, at uh, one likely diagnosis, especially if it's irregular. Um, are they monomorphic? Basically, it just means are they all the same shape? And, and we are going to talk about that in a little while when we look at wandering atrial pacemaker. Um, so when you have polymorphic, i.e. more than one shape to your, to your P waves, uh, the chances are they're not all coming from the sinoatrial node. And, and we, we refer to that as wandering atrial pacemaker. If you imagine the SA node is the pacemaker, if it's wandering, i.e. The, 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 the signal is starting from various points, then, then it's wandering. Um, is the PQRS ratio one to one? We've already kind of covered that in normal sinus rhythm. If, if the P's and the QRS's aren't matched, there's some form of atrioventricular block. And again, if the PR interval is not constant, then, then we know there's, there's potentially a block going on at the AV node as well. Uh, and then we're going to talk about QRS complexes. So next week, we're going to talk about axis and, and the bundle branch blocks, which is where you look more closely at your QRS complexes. But basically, is there an association between, between what's coming out of the atria, the P wave, and, and what's happening in the ventricles, the QRS complex? If, if they're not associated, again, it strongly, strongly makes you suspect a, a block of some sort. Um, Again, we've talked about what a wide QRS complex means, so they should be below 120 milliseconds. If they're not, again, we're, we're potentially looking down at one of the bundle branch blocks. Are they grouped together? Uh, again, that's kind of looking, is there any kind of, um, is there any kind of coordination to this irregular rhythm? And are the drop beats? Again, it's, it's looking at different types of, of, um, of blocks. So hopefully that all starts to make sense. Um, is everyone keeping up? Am I going at a good speed for everyone? Is there any questions uh, at the moment? Nobody's typing up, so I'm assuming not, but uh, feel free, don't be afraid. As I say, if there's something you don't want to put in the chat, you can um, you can tweet us, email us, or, or WhatsApp us. Fabulous, it's good to see. Thank you, folks. Okay, so we talked about fast or slow, so your most, your, your easiest arrhythmias, if you like, and don't forget being, being too fast or too slow is an arrhythmia is is um is what we see here so throw in the chat who's who's gonna gonna what what do we call a fast rhythm when it's sinus in origin nice and easy let's get started with that tachy yes it's sinus tachycardia um and what's the opposite when it's slow lovely thank you uh, matt and ash sinus bradycardia well done perfect and now this rhythm that we've got here if you want to use your little uh rule of thumb of 300 divided by the number of big squares what's the rate of this rhythm does anyone want to throw that in the chat have a quick 
go at calculating the rate. And then the second part of that question is actually, what do we call that? So not AF, Jay, we are going to talk about AF, not atrial flutter either, Ash, we're going to talk about that um, in a little while. So the top, uh, Barry, I think, uh, Brian, sorry, you're looking at the top one uh, is, is around 150, fine, yeah, so the bottom one, well done, Matt, you've got it, um, it's around 37 uh, beats per minute, correct. So when a, when a rhythm is, is going along below 40, does anyone know what we're, um, what we call that? Absolute Braddy. Lovely. Absolute bradycardia. Fab. Loads of answers coming in. Thank you, folks. OK, so I just say we're nice and clear on all the terms then. Um, so this top ECG is sinus tachycardia. And as some of you have calculated, the rate is somewhere in the region of 150 beats per minute. It's, it's pretty quick. Um, so that is a sinus tachycardia. And, and we know it's sinus because if you look closely, particularly in lead V1, and V2, you can see some P waves, albeit they are buried within the T waves. So with faster rhythms, sometimes it can be really hard to find the uh, the P waves. So that's that's not uncommon. But look in your in your um, T waves if you see little notches notches in there that that don't look like they're part of the T wave, um, and they're regular and they're occurring at, at each beat. Chances are that's a P wave sitting on top of a T. P's on T's. Um, and, and that's relatively common. So that's a sinus tachycardia. Okay, it's nice and regular and we can see P waves. So this is a sinus bradycardia, but more correctly, when the rhythm, when the rate, sorry, is below 40, which this one is, it's about 37, 35 to 37, um, we call it absolute bradycardia. So anything less than 40, absolute bradycardia, whether or not it's sinus, it's just what it's referred to. And generally speaking, that's abnormal. Even the healthiest people generally, generally, I mean, I'm sure there'll be some Olympic athletes that break this exception, but most people's heart rates don't ever get below 40 unless they're unwell in some way. So, fab. All making sense. Lovely. So, let's make it a little bit more interactive then. So, we've got a nice little case study. So, uh, you are wherever you are. So, uh, we are in a GP surgery, and your 25 year old Caucasian white male comes in. He's normally fit and well. Um, for those of you that work on ambulances, you can assume this is something from 111. It's got that kind of feel to it, doesn't it? So 25-year-old male is generally well. He's got a bit of a, uh, a cough and a cold. That sounds like it's ambulance worthy. So uh, he's got no medical history, no surgical history, drug history, or family uh, history of cardiac issues. He's a non-smoker, drinks at the weekends with his mates, doesn't take drugs, um, and he's just got suggest symptoms suggestive of, of lower respiratory tract infections. So, what are we thinking in the chat, guys? What are we thinking about this chap's cardiac risk factors at this stage? Low, absolutely. I'd say they're about as low as they get, aren't they? He's, he's otherwise well. Um, and and we, we reckon he's got a chest infection, so we, we can probably assume he does. So we, we go in there, uh, we're good clinicians. We go and take some obs, just make sure he's not septic before we, uh, before we send him on his way with his amoxicillin. So he is a uh, respirator of 16. So that's a 98, heart rate 70, you note that it's regularly irregular. Temperature 37.5 BP, 116.78. Are we worried about any of those ops? Is there anything there that we're going to want to investigate further? Heart rate, yeah, heart rate, heart rate's okay. Um, it's just, uh, it, it, you wouldn't generally expect a 25 year old to have an irregular heart rate, would you? So yeah, 12 lady ECG, lovely folks, we're all on the right, uh, we're all on the right lines. Everything else matches the presentation, absolutely perfect. So we're, we're, we're noticing that a 25 year old probably shouldn't have a, an irregular heart rate. So we whack on the four lead just cause that's all we've got to hand at the moment uh, in our GP surgery or wherever we are. So this is the rhythm we get, okay. Um, so have a good look. So just work through your your six rules of of um, sinus rhythm and and start to think what what have we got here? So is it is it regular? Well, quite clearly not. Is is the rate uh, below a hundred? Well, we've told you the heart rate seventy. Okay, so we're okay there. Everything else, you know, work work through your six rules. Is there a P, P for every QRS? Is is the PR interval interval constant? Is the QRS narrow? Is the QT interval okay? I think you'll find everything else is okay, apart from it's just irregular. So we've all had a good look at that. Get your phones out. What are we going to call this ECG? So what uh, I say ECG, we've only got a 
four lead rhythm strip, but it's enough for us to make the diagnosis. So what are we going to call this rhythm? Get on your smartphones, menti.com 80971 and answer the question for us, guys. Think carefully about the answer. I'll wait for um, a good chunk of you. So get your smartphones out. That's it. Numbers going up. Let's get uh, a good number of you voting. Let's make it as interactive as possible. If you if you interact, you learn more. Is the theory. Lovely. I'll let it get up to at least half of you before we uh, start sharing the answers. Well done, guys. That's it. Keep voting. Okay. Lovely. So we're up to about half of you. Let's see where most of you are going. Okay. Anyone else want to have a, a go in there before we uh, before we uh, reveal the answer? Okay. Seems to have stopped about there. Folks, so you're mostly between uh, you're mostly between sinus arrhythmia and respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is kind of where I thought everybody was going to end up. And sure enough, um, the respiratory sinus arrhythmia is the is the correct diagnosis. Okay, we'll talk about why the others aren't. So sinus arrhythmia, yes, it's it's a bit of a trick question. I was just saying who's who's awake and who's studied stuff like this before. So sinus arrhythmia is is exactly what is going on here, but there's a specific type of sinus arrhythmia that is most likely to be the case, and and actually is, can be quite a normal physiological finding in an otherwise well young adult like this so secondary heart block it's it's not but i like your thinking we're going to talk about that in in more detail wandering atrial pacemaker we're going to show you an example of that um very shortly um and good nobody thought it was atrial fibrillation which we're going to talk about later so well done uh, for 38 percent that have, that have obviously done some reading around this before and the 54 percent you're not wrong okay so you're not wrong it is a sinus arrhythmia um as you'll see from the next slide if it loads Sorry, we have issues with Mentimeter freezing the PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so differential diagnoses, DDX, you'll see that come up, uh, ink marking and things like that. So our differentials for somebody that presents with a, uh, a regularly irregular heart rate, but they're otherwise well. In young, healthy adults, it's respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So how does that work? Intrathoracic pressure reduces as you take a, a breath in, that reduces vagal tone. Uh, and thus increases heart rate. It's quite simple. Uh, the opposite occurs during during expiration. So you, you probably find, and, and I would suggest the vast majority of you probably have this to an extent. If you take your pulse, take a deep breath, well, you know, slow breath in, you'll probably feel that your pulse increases. Take a slow exhale, you'll probably find that your pulse decreases very slightly. Some do, some don't. If you if you were hooked up to an ETG monitor when you're doing it, you might notice it a little bit more. But um, they think it's, it's actually quite a normal physiological finding and, and I saw some research recently that they think that um, this may actually uh, improve the ventilation perfusion matching within the alveoli. So if you think, um, for those of you that have looked into um, the physiology of, of the lungs in any detail, um, as you take a breath in, you generally mismatch the, the VQ, the ventilation perfusion um, gradient, by, by flooding the, the alveoli with oxygen, oxygen rich air that you've just breathed in. But actually the the, the the underlying blood flow through the alveoli capillary beds um, hasn't increased. So, so actually by increasing the heart rate momentarily while you take a deep breath, it actually improves that VQ, uh, the matching, which is something I, I found quite interesting because I hadn't really thought of it that way, but that seems to be uh, why it happens and, and potentially it, it, it happens more often than not. So it might just be subtle. So um lovely so no questions coming in keep them coming in if you're if you're struggling with anything so when when we see this in older comorbid patients so it's just worth bearing in mind that it's less likely to be just from intrathoracic pressures it's more likely to be to do with age-related baroreceptor changes as it says there uh, which is kind of secondary to heart disease um we've also i've also seen some some stuff around cardiac glycoside so patients that are on digoxin for example um may have this um this sinus arrhythmia um uh, exacerbated and and sometimes us giving morphine can exacerbate an underlying uh, sinus arrhythmia it's not, not a reason not to give it but it's just just be aware if you if you suddenly start to notice the sinus arrhythmia it probably was there you just just exacerbated it with your morphine or, or digoxin if you're prescribing that um 
Fab. So that's sinus arrhythmias in, in basic terms. Um, there, there's not much to them really. They're, they're very rarely of any of any in, in interest really. In your, your older comorbid patients, you might want to screen them for other cardiac risk factors, etc. But but of, of all the rhythms you're going to see, it's not particularly uh, um, good. So John's just popped in there. So uh, use of codeine, fabulous. Yet yeah, so um, vagal agents. So codeine um, in in long in high or prolonged doses is is going to act as a vagal agent, definitely. So so that would it probably is that you you had it underlying and and in taking codeine um, you exacerbated that. So thank you, John. That helps puts it into uh, into practice. It's not something I've ever seen personally, given morphine, I've never really noticed, or maybe I just haven't been looking for it. Maybe next time I do it, I'll, I'll see it. Who knows? So, um, so regularly irregular, let's have some, some uh, ideas of, of, um, of what that looks like. So I think we've just covered the one at the top there, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So do you see what I, I mean by regularly irregular? There is some pattern to this chaos, isn't there? You see that the rhythm strip isn't quite long enough, but if you look off to the left here, the the uh, the QRS complexes are fairly narrowly grouped. Um, during exhalation, perhaps in this case, they they seem to widen up a little bit. During the next inhalation, they get tighter, then they then they widen off. So there is there is a pattern to the irregularity, and that's exactly what we mean. Um, yes, yeah, you're right. There is there is some um, Pima Charlie going on there, which we're going to talk about in the future. Ash, yes, there is some probably some atrial enlargement. This this um, this could be an ECG from an older patient, in which case, if you were looking at a non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia with some P. mitrali, you'd be thinking along the lines of, of heart failure uh, or at least ischemic heart disease of some sorts, right? Um, so good spots. So next one, um, so somebody's already um, thrown this diagnosis out. So, well, actually, no, it was in the quiz, wasn't it? A few of you voted for this. So what do we think this is here? So if you can see, you've got, you've got groups of, of QRS complexes. Sometimes they're in triplets. Sometimes they're in um, what's the what's the quad in quads? <laughs> okay, yeah, heart block. Fab. Does anyone want to have a have a, a stab at diagnosing which heart block this is? We are going to cover it in a minute. Uh, not two to one. No, we will talk about that. But you're on the right lines. So, what do we notice about the PR interval? It's increasing. Second degree type. Mobits type type. You've said you've said everything except the right number at the end. <laughs> Winky back, yeah. Mobits one, lovely. Well done. Well done. We're going to talk about it in a lot of detail. So, so that is an example of a regularly irregular rhythm. Okay, so you have you have groups of, of QRS complexes, uh, and and if you printed this rhythm strip a bit longer, you'd probably see another four. So to see three or four triplets or quads of, of QRS complexes in a Mobits one is 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 about right. Oh, so this so uh, there you go. Second degree heart block type one. It's a Mobitz one or wanky back uh, phenomenon, as as it's often known. Lots of names, and and they're all just designed to confuse us. That's that's their only purpose. So, but most most commonly, your second degrees are known as Mobitz uh, blocks. That's the when you, when you hear them talked about in clinic. The one at the bottom. Does anyone want to have a go? Um, it's 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 a bit of a. We're, we're going to talk about PVCs at a later date. But basically, you have a a, a pulse generating um, QRS complex here, and this is a PVC. For those of you that haven't seen them before, don't worry. Just commit them to memory. They exist. We'll talk about why they exist later. So, uh, a normal pulse followed by uh, a um, a PVC. Normal pulse PVC. Normal pulse PVC. Um, so, might be something not too many have come across. This is known as ventricular bigeminy. Um, you can get uh, ventricular trigeminy, which is two normal pulse producing beats followed by a, a PVC, and quadrigeminy, which is three normal pulse producing. Um, big Emily, I think that's a, a, a um, what do you call it? A typo, isn't it? A autocorrect fail. Big Emily. But I, li I like the name Big Emily. Maybe we should rename it. <laughs> Hopefully there's no Emily's in the crowd of the Bigeminy, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm sticking with Big Emily, that's what I'm going to call it from now on. Uh, AVRT, um, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia is associated with Wolf Parkinson White J. So we are going to um, we are going to talk about Wolf Parkinson White at a later date. So it's not an AVRT. Uh, AVRTs are generally characterized by short PR intervals or no PR interval. So we'll come back to those at a later date. So. So there's three examples of regularly irregular rhythms. I'm sure there are loads more. Um, it's just to, to give you an idea of what we mean um, by them.
so irregularly irregular and remember i said at the beginning there's only three possible things it can be if it's irregularly irregular but do you see what i mean that these are just chaotic rhythms so there's no there's no coordination of, of these um these qrs complexes basically so you're uh with, with the, the, the bottom that this is the best rhythm strip i could get to to show this particular phenomenon and actually annoyingly that qrs is irregular but uh, which they they wouldn't always be but um so to see an irregularly irregular um rhythm there's three things it can be does anyone want to just throw in the chat what this is at the top? There's three three rhythm strips, so they all show the same phenomenon. I just want to show you that it uh, it comes in lots of different forms. Lovely, most of you are getting it. Uh, atrial flutter on the left. So no, this is the, the, we're we're gonna we're gonna compare atrial flutter and atrial fib in a minute. So atrial flutter would have some more coordinated P waves there. These these aren't coordinated. Absolutely, everybody's nailing it AF. Uh, third degree heart block, we're gonna talk about later, so no. Um, although I can see what you're saying with this bottom with this bottom rhythm strip, it would be hard to, to differentiate initially what was going on, other than that the QRS complexes are irregularly irregular, which is characteristic of atrial fibrillation. So well done everyone that said that. So, so if, you, if you see an irregularly irregular rhythm, what are we what are we predominantly looking at we're looking to see is there any p waves and that's the only question you've got to ask yourself is there any p waves can we see p waves in this rhythm strip no i can just see artifact or or what it's technically known as in this case is fibrillation same in this rhythm all i can see here is is you know random jerking of the of the baseline another good giveaway for atrial fibrillation is uh, alternating qrs heights so no no sorry no pattern to any of the qrs complexes so there's absolutely no pattern there at all or here or here they're all just randomly spaced and if you notice particularly in this example the qrs heights are quite different that's really characteristic of af um, so between af and complete heart block so you're looking for p waves so two well two way two, the first thing you're looking for is p waves and and the other thing with with third degree heart block as you'll see complete heart block um has just come up in the chat um you will see regular qrs complexes okay and we'll talk about why in a minute so the rhythm in in third degree is is almost always regular um it's almost always slow and and it's almost always wide but we'll talk about we'll talk about why so but to make the differentiation if this was a little bit more regular and you weren't quite sure the differentiation comes from whether or not you can see p waves in a third degree heart block you'll see p waves they just won't be in any way connected to the to the qrs complexes so all three of these are are versions of atrial fibrillation um and it is a very very common uh rhythm particularly in the older generation okay so I said there was three potential differentials for uh, atrial fibrilla, for, sorry, for an irregularly irregular rhythm. So unfortunately, as I say, this rhythm strip at the bottom here doesn't show up particularly well, but in this condition, you quite often get irregularly irregular QRS complexes. And we've mentioned it already, it's wandering atrial pacemaker, okay? Wandering atrial pacemaker just basically means that the, the, the P waves are coming from different points in the heart. And you can see that because each of these P's is a different shape. Does everybody see that? That one's got no P. And we're back to the beginning there. So it looks like it's firing from multiple locations within the within the um, the left, sorry, the right ventricle. Uh, right atrium, sorry, get my words out right. So where we have more than three morphologies of P wave, we call it wandering atrial pacemaker. And I did say there was three potential diagnoses. The only thing that makes the third one is whether it becomes tachycardic. So when you get a fast wandering atrial pacemaker, that's over 100 beats per minute, we call it multifocal atrial tachycardia. All right. And one thing I just wanted to mention was, was AF. You've probably heard of fast AF and slow AF. This is an example of fast AF. So it's just AF with a heart rate of over 100. Slow AF is less than, less than 60, as you should imagine. The technical term is rapid ventricular um, reaction. So RVR, uh, response, or response or reaction. Fab. So that's irregularly irregular rhythms. And we just we, we've talked a little bit about this. This just puts it into into pictures for you. So how do we differentiate between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? Uh, atrial fibrillation, you're looking for coordinated atrial activity and lovely a sawtooth pattern. J is very characteristic. This is a great uh, example of some atrial flutter. Um, you don't you don't see it this clearly that often, but that's that's a great example of, of showing you. So with atrial fibrillation, you see there's no coordinated atrial activity. It looks like artifact. It's just a wobbly line, doesn't it? There's no coordinated P waves. There's no sawtooth pattern. There's nothing. 
The other thing is, are the QRSs regular or reg irregular? If they're irregular, the chances are it's AF. If they are regular, the chances are it's atrial flutter. Does that make sense to everyone? Coordinated atrial activity and whether or not we have regular rhythms um, is how we make the differentiation between AF and atrial flutter. Lovely. We are going to talk about atrial flutter very quickly, but we, we characterize it by how many P waves it takes to generate a QRS complex. So in this case, this is three to one. This is atrial flutter with three to one conduction, and that's one of the most common types. You either get two to one or three to one conduction. Um, the atrial the atria flutter at a rate of about 300 beats per minute. So you can generally work out that this is going to be. Uh, so when you get two to one conduction at a rate of 150, uh, et cetera. Lovely. So another case study, let's, let's keep you all interacting. So 82 year old uh, Caucasian female, doesn't come into your surgery very often. She's come in today, uh, which you think is unusual. So you obviously you want to go and see her because she doesn't complain very much. Uh, essential hypertension and she's on amlodipine 10 milligrams once a day for that. Otherwise she appears to be well, as I say, she doesn't, she hasn't been in for years. So she could have another thing going on. So she tells you she's got a three month history, progressive um, dyspnea exertion. Um, she's got a little bit of ankle swelling and she's said that she's got flutters in her chest, especially at night. She's got no symptoms of infection. What would you like to do first of all with this lady? So she's sitting in front of you in your surgery. She's just told you off. Doctor, paramedic, nurse, I've, 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 been, I've been having three months of, of, every time I walk anywhere, I get a bit breathless. I feel some flutters. Uh, lovely, OBS and an ECG, thank you folks, we're all on the same page. So we're going to examine her, I'm going to have a quick listen to her chest because she said she's breathless. So chest was clear, heart sounds are normal, but she has got some bilateral pitting edema, um, so fluid collecting around the, the lower limbs up to her mid-calf, so it's fairly substantial. Respirate, high normal, um, SAT's normal, heart rate's high, it's irregularly irregular and her blood pressure's high. What are we thinking folks? What are we thinking is, so, so the question is, uh, when, when I say, what is your top differential? What is, what is the thing that you're thinking, what, what do you think's changed with this lady, basically? Because there are two correct answers here. Um, but what is the most pressing matter, do you think? So you're, you're sitting there waiting for someone to bring you the ECG machine. Um, what, do you, what do you think is the most pressing matter with this lady? She's not, she's only medicated for high blood pressure. Shall I flip back to the last screen? She's 82 years old. She doesn't come in very often. She's only medicated for high blood pressure. Um, and she said for the last three months, something's changed. What do you think has changed? And, and as I say, there are two potentially. So uh, not in the chat, folks, straight on to menti.com 80971. It's the same number as last time. Get some votes in there. What do we think the main issue going on today that we need to address is? And I'll talk about why it's not the other correct answer. If that makes sense. Lovely. We'll let half of you get on like we did last time, and then we'll see uh, see what you're all thinking. Do you want to go back to the slide yet? So, well, whilst you answer that on your phones, folks, there's the slide again. So, 82 year old lady. As far as we know, she's just got high blood pressure. That's all we're treating her for. And for the last three months, something's changed. She's she's breathless. She's got some ankle swelling, and she's got some flutters in her chest and um and those so paul um so paul the the, the options are are on the uh, the mentimeter one but pe um pe yes it'd be something you'd want to rule out wouldn't it definitely in this case it's it's not was it pravi sorry i was reading from a distance without my glasses pravi not paul Fab, so good, so good for you of you have voted there. Let's just have a look at where you're going with these. Okay, interesting, interesting. I've tripped you. Okay, so remember I said, what's the most pressing matter here today? Um, and it will depend on, on, um, on your uh, knowledge of kind of nice guidelines, I suppose. So this lovely lady, shall I just go back a slide just so I can make the point. So this lovely lady has come in she's only medicated for, for high blood pressure and you've got a newly irregular, irregular heart rate, which is quite a high. What did I say before? So there's only three possible things that can give you an irregularly irregular heartbeat. And, and what were they? 
atrial fibrillation, wandering atrial pacemaker, or um, uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia, uh, which it could be because obviously the heart rate's up at 122. So what's the most pressing matter? Well, well, actually, if, if it's irregularly irregular, I'm thinking an 82-year-old lady that she's probably got AF and we don't know about it. Now, the most pressing matter is dealing with that AF, isn't it? So I absolutely understand why you're saying hypertensive heart failure because she's hypertensive and she has symptoms of heart failure. But do you think maybe they've been made worse by the new onset of atrial fibrillation? So an interesting fact, and sure enough, your, your practice nurse pops in with the ECG machine, you pop the leads on and she's in, in a nice bit of fast AF there. So when, when somebody goes into atrial fibrillation, I think the next slide explains it. So when somebody goes into atrial fibrillation, you get um, uncoordinated activity within the atria. Okay, so you get fluttering of the atria. They don't pre-fill the ventricles as effectively as they normally would. Uh, and with reduced ventric ventricular preload, you get reduced cardiac output. And actually in, in, in an acute atrial fibrillation, when somebody first becomes AF, they can lose up to 30% of their cardiac output. Now, do you think, Perhaps this lady, maybe she had some hypertensive heart failure in the background, but actually three months ago, she went into AF and that 30% reduction in her cardiac output has now thrown her into uh, symptomatic heart failure. So that's that's the trick in the question. And I know it was, it was a bugger of a question. Imagine if that came up in your exams. I'm sure, I'm sure stranger things have happened. So it's, it's worth knowing stuff like this. So nice guidelines say as a matter of urgency, we need to treat this lady for, for atrial fibrillation. Okay. Does anyone want to just throw in the chat? Why are we so fussed about AF? What, what, what's this lady at risk of? If I say, thanks for coming in, Ethel, we'll, we'll review your blood pressure in two weeks. What's she, what's she likely to have? Stroke, stroke, stroke. Absolutely. And not a good kind. Lovely. So she's, she's definitely um, a high risk patient for having a stroke. She's hypertensive. She's got probable AF. Well, we, we've now diagnosed her AF. We've seen that ECG. Uh, that's come back. You can see there that there's no coordinated atrial activity. The rhythm is irregularly irregular. There's differing QRS heights. I'm uh, uh, absolutely certain that's, that's an atrial fibrillation, aren't we? Atrial appendage thrombosis, absolutely. And, and when that dislodges and, and gets pumped around systemic circulation, that's how the stroke happens. Um, fabulous. Obviously, some really good understanding in the chat this evening. So atrial fibrillation, as I say, this, this diagram puts it nicely. Normally in health, your SA node transmits through the internodal pathways. To the AV nodes in AF, that, that link is broken and, and all your kind of um, atrial myocytes are firing off at random and you get fibrillation. Okay reduces cardiac output and, and can put a patient that wasn't normally symptomatic. Um, would somebody always notice their AF symptoms? Interesting question. No, I've, I've certainly found AF as an incidental finding in patients that, that have told me they don't have any symptoms, whether or not they, they have genuinely noticed any fluttering or irregular heart rate. Or I, I would suggest most of us are most aware of things like that at night. Most of us lie there and, and you can feel your heartbeat. Generally, you can, you know, if you're going to get palpitations, you generally feel them. Uh, most vividly then don't you so whether or not the patients genuinely have no symptoms or not i don't know but i, but I certainly have diagnosed af in in patients that have been otherwise well and they've just come in for something else and we've felt their pulse and it's been oh that's not normal we don't know about that so so potentially yes but i think it's more likely they're going to present with palpitations or some acute heart failure type symptoms breathlessness tiredness that type of thing great so this is a real bugger of a question, really, isn't it? So, so it's really only kind of it's it's going to be aimed at those people that are aware of the nice guidelines. So, what do nice say we should do for this patient? Um, have a go. We'll talk about it. It's uh, probably more aimed at those of you that are going into or in primary care. Or so this this lovely lady, she's come in. We've we've just found that she's got AF and she's got symptoms of heart failure. Her heart rate was 122, I think it was originally. It's tacky. Oh, sorry, I did. Uh, I mean to hover over this as well. We did some bloods as well because we're that quick. Whilst Ethel's sitting there, we managed to get her her BNP and her GFR for those of you that are, are going to give this question a good go. So her BNP is up at 513. So we're definitely um, we're definitely uh, diagnosing some heart failure here, whether it's acute or acute on chronic, we don't know. Uh, and her kidney function for her age is fine. So we're not particularly worried about what we're prescribing. So for those of you that haven't come across those blood tests, BNP is, is a marker of heart failure. Um, brain neutropenic peptide or something. I can never remember what the N stands for. Um, 
and uh, glomerular filtration rate is a measure of kidney function which is very important when we're going to put somebody on a new medication particularly for long term so lovely i'm great to see so many of you having a go thank you i know it's a real uh, naturitic thank you uh, samuel i could never remember that one <laughs> bnp if you, if you just use the acronym nobody knows that you don't know the answer Lovely. Thanks for having a go, everyone. This is a real bugger of a question, but uh, those of you that are doing um, PA studies or medical school, uh, type, this type of question could easily come up. Well, wow, wowee, wonderful. Well done, guys. Okay, got it right. 42% of you. Okay, so nice guidelines, just whistle stop tour. Um, okay, first line treatment is going to be uh, an anticoagulant. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, first line treatment is going to be an anticoagulant. Okay, so generally, um, I'm going to flip to the next slide because it explains it quite well. But um, a pixaban and bisoprolol is is the correct answer. There's two things nice to say we should do for this lady. Uh, we should anticoagulate her to prevent her having a stroke, um, and we should be um, putting her on on a uh, a rate controlling uh, medication. And bisoprolol is exactly the drug we're going to go for. Sorry, it's just this every time. There we go. Right. So we're going to work up an atrial fibrillation patient very quickly. For those of you that haven't come across anything like this, TRADS-VASC is, is a scoring system we use to assess. Uh, when you've diagnosed somebody with atrial fibrillation, you always do a TRADS-VASC to see what their risk of um, having a, a stroke is. Anyone over 75 is automatically going to score two, so they're automatically going to be high risk. Yeah, that's, that's just a given. If, if you've got a 75-year-old in AF, they're, they're going to be indicated for... Um, um, anticoagulation. Okay, then you're going to look at their has bled score to try and figure out how likely they are. So has bled. Have a look at it. So MD Calc is a brilliant app, uh, application you can go and look at on website. Um, has bled. will will we'll look at. Um, um, we'll look at the risk of bleeding. So when we when we talk about putting somebody on anticoagulants or or um, so warfarin, apixaban, rivaroxaban, as you see there, you've got to look at what's the risk of causing spontaneous bleeding and, and has bled helps you with that. So if they have a really high has bled score. You need to have that real heart to heart discussion with the patient and say, look, the risks versus benefits both ways. All right. But that's, that's more for the guys in primary care. If, if any of you are tuned in, um, that's the type of thing um, your GPs are going to expect you to go in with, I suspect when you go for your debriefs or whatever. So, um, Warfarin is preferred over novel um, anticoags, so your novel zeropixaban, rivaroxaban, adoxaban, things like that. They're, they're favoured when people have high uh, falls risk. Does anyone know why? Does anyone want to throw in why we prefer warfarin in somebody that's likely to fall over? I know STC admin knows. We can reverse it, lovely. <laughs> lovely, we can reverse it with vitamin K. Okay, uh, warfarin is, is a vitamin K antagonist effectively. If, if you give someone vitamin K, uh, you can you can um, reduce their their risk of bleeding again. A pixaban and rivaroxaban are the new ones, though we do like them. We'd like most of our patients to be on one of the the NOAX because they require less monitoring. They're less labour intensive. They're less costly, um, and it's less of a pain for the patient to have to come in and have their INRs done, which they don't have to have done with the NOAX. A pixaban's favoured with somebody with symptomatic heart failure. That's why we've picked that for ethyl or. Uh, whatever we called her, and uh, rivaroxaban is favoured when they've already had a stroke or a TIA, it's just something um, useful to know. Going to consider echoes, TTE, transthoracic echo or transesophageal echo in patients that you're going to do rhythm control. So the, the, the next decision once you've anticoagulated this patient is whether or not you're going to rate control or rhythm control. Rate control is, is going to be a beta blocker or a rate limiting CCB. She's already on uh, amlodipine, so we can't give her any more CCBs. Um, and, and actually she's got some heart failure, so we really don't want her on, on calcium channel blockers. Um, digoxin is a second line or a first line of the sedentary, which she isn't. Uh, rhythm control is generally for you younger patients or for those with reversible causes. And generally we look at ablation, you've probably heard of that, which is just um, killing the cells basically that are, that are misfiring. Whistle stop tour, refer to NICE guidance, uh, CG 180, particularly if you're looking at this on YouTube years down the line when things may have changed. So make sure you're up to date with the correct guidance before you actually go and put any of this in practice. But Chad's Fask and Hasbled are really good things to do um, when you when you find a new AF. We've got a, what's the difference between rate control and rate limiting? So, um, so it's rate control and, uh, do you mean, you don't want this to finish, <laughs> oh bless you. So uh, the difference between rate control and rate limiting, uh, 
I, I understand yeah, rhythm control. So I was going to say they are the same thing. So rate control is um, slowing the rate. So we, um, we know with um, this 82-year-old lady, her heart rate was 122. Um, so we need to bring that down. Ideally, with, a, with an AF, we're looking to medicate them to a resting heart rate of around 80. If, if that's possible. Rhythm control is effectively putting them back into normal sinus rhythm. There's three ways of doing it. Cardioversion, which is obviously uh, an electric shock to the heart done under sedation. Um, pharmacological, which is the use of digoxin, amiodarone, things along those lines, but they have high risk, risk rates, if you like. Ablation generally tends to be um, uh, ablation tends to be your, your younger patients or patients which have uh, obvious uh, reversible AF and, and that's generally the decision for that is going to be made by a cardiologist it's certainly not going to be done by uh, anybody in primary care or, or in the ambulance service setting um, it's just bearing in mind what, what is available the majority of patients and actually NICE recommends the majority of patients go on to rate control but they do have a list of exceptions which you can read at, at online on their um, clinical guidance 180 uh, let's just go through the questions. Uh, rhythm control, uh, when do we give verapamil? Verapamil is a rate limiting calcium channel blocker. So you're going to give that if uh, the beta blocker isn't tolerated. So in much the same way as we, we uh, control blood pressure, we always have kind of a first line and then a what to give if, um, if that's not tolerated. So, um, so beta blocker, um, bisoprolol is, is the most cardiac specific and that's the one that, uh, that we're going to always favour. Uh, unless the patient's sedentary, they get to joxin. If they don't tolerate a beta blocker, we're going to put them on a rate limiting CCB. In this case, a rate limiting CCB is likely to be contraindicated, A, because she's already on a, a CCB around lodipine for her blood pressure, um, and B, because she has some heart failure and actually you don't want to um, reduce that uh, contractility of the, of the cardiac myocytes any further. So. Hopefully that explains that and doesn't make it not too nonsensical for everyone. So lovely. Right. Atrial flutter. Are uh, ionotropes licensed in AF? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, Jay. I will find out. Uh, if you drop your email address in there, I'll, I will find out and get back to you. Lovely. So um atrial flutter atrial flutter the main difference is rather than uncoordinated activity within the atrium it's um hyper excited myocardial cells effectively um that that create uh, all you need to know really is they create a kind of circular um uh, um conduction pathway which which gives rise to these um sort of um these sort of um p waves that you can see uh, in the rhythm scene. This is just to be aware that it can go in two ways. Typical atrial flutter has an anti-clockwise motion. You can tell that by negative uh, sawtooth P waves in, in leads two and three. Um, and if you get reverse flutter, it, it can be seen as positive waves. So flutter is a little bit less common than, than atrial fib, but as I say, you, you, can, um, you can generally spot it because of the flutter waves, the regular QRS complexes, and then you grade it by the, the number of P waves it takes to produce a QRS complex. Two to three, sorry, two to one or three to one is normal. One to one is unsustainable. You can't have a ventricular rate of um, 300. It won't happen, it'll go into VF. Uh, more than five to one is known as a high AV block, just nice to know. But you can get variable conduction. So whilst I say it's normally regular, you can get some drop beats where it, where it, um, it doesn't conduct. Okay. Uh, very quickly, why it doesn't conduct is, is to do with uh, refractory periods. Do you remember this horrible diagram from the first lecture where we look at um, electrical potential within the cardiac myocytes? Effectively, these, these sodium channels that uh, the voltage gated sodium channels that open in, in phase zero are protected from reopening until um, during phase three when the, when the cell uh, repolarizes past minus 50 millivolts, those sodium channels are, are reactivated in effect. So it doesn't matter how big the stimulus that comes along uh, until we've got to the, around this point in, in phase three, um, that cell can't reactivate. And that's why you don't get one-to-one -one conduction. And if you do, um, you generally end up with a very unstable uh, ventricular myocyte. And, and it's worth noting the highest sustainable coordinated heart rate is 240 beats per minute. But I don't think I'd like to have a heart rate that high. I don't think I'd be very comfortable. Um, I'll leave that to obviously you'll, you'll, this will be uh, uploaded to the website so you can have a read around um, um, these periods a little bit more. I'm conscious that we're, we're, um, we're going to run over tonight folks so um, we will uh, we'll crack on with AV blocks um, now it's obviously taking a little bit longer to get through that than I thought it would so. AV blocks in their simplest form so they're, they're, they're 
commonly confused and, and they shouldn't be really. You just need to kind of have a little think, stop and think about what's going on. So in health, SA node fires through the internodal pathways to the AV node. It's held onto it for, for 120 to 200 milliseconds and then it's released down the bundle of HIS and that causes ventricular contraction. So any variation of that is, is going to be, uh, particularly where, where it's, it happens in the AV node, is going to be a block. So if the PR interval is too long or, or sometimes uh, the AV node doesn't uh, conduct the impulse, then that's going to be an atrioventricular block, an AV block. Okay, and it's summed up here. A, a conduction delay of more than 200 milliseconds or a failure to conduct any of the impulses, you have an AV block. First degree, really nice and easy, folks. All first degree is, is a conduction delay of more than 200 milliseconds but where, where that conduction delay doesn't change. Okay, so you can see in this example we've got down here, our PR interval is, is sitting at about 280 milliseconds there, isn't it? It's constant, about 280, 280, 280. It's over 200, it's not changing. It's called first degree heart block. All right, hopefully just a refresher for, for most of you, but first degree heart block is an AV, uh, sorry, PR interval of more than 200 milliseconds, but one that's constant, okay? And just for, and nice to know there, if, if it's more than 300 milliseconds, it's called marked first degree heart block. Either way, are we interested in first degree heart block? Yes or no in the chat? Does it bother us? Are we interested? Are we going to call cardiology at once? No, we're not. No, we're not interested. First degree heart block, it's, it's, it's an incidental finding. We're not interested. The only thing I want you to commit to memory, and we're going to talk about it next week, if you see first degree heart block, you're going to look for bifascicular and trifascicular blocks, but we'll talk about what that means next week. The only, the only thing, when you, when you see a first degree, you go, oh, okay, just make sure you haven't got a bifascicular or a trifascicular, but don't worry, commit that to memory. We'll talk more next week. I'm conscious of time. I said this would finish at eight, and, and it's not going to, so I apologise. I'll, I'll crack on. Um, third degree heart block I'm going to talk about next. I know it's not in order. Third degree is, is also just as easy to understand, although I admit not always easy to spot. Okay, so third degree heart block is where the AV node doesn't conduct anything. So first degree is it, it conducts everything, but it's delayed. Third degree heart block is it doesn't conduct anything. Okay, really simple stuff, guys. What happens? Do you remember last week we talked about there's, there's um, cardiac myocytes, specific cardiac myocytes that, that pace the heart. Most of them are in the SA node and in health they're the only ones that fire. If the SA node doesn't talk to the AV node because of a block or because of other dysfunction or because it's, it's knackered, the, the pacemaker cells in the AV node take over. And, and what happens is you get a slower, wider QRS complex because they don't fire as quickly and they fire further down the system. So you get, so you get a, an aberrant conduction effectively. So the way to spot it is that the P's are regular, the QRS complexes are regular, but neither are in any way associated. Okay, so complete AV disassociation is, is what this is also known as. Complete heart block, third degree heart block, AV disassociation. They're, they're known, you know, all, all by those names. And, and all it is, P's are constant, and sorry, the P waves are regular, they're there. There's no P wave issues, they're not changing shape. The QRSs are there. They're generally slow and generally wide, but they're regular. But the two just aren't talking. Does that make sense? I think it's a it's a quick it's a quick route through. But um, is anyone really struggling with that? So uh, is a patient symptomatic with third degree? Often they are, yes. And uh, the trusts that I work for um, both would treat that as a blue light um, transfer. Yes. So um, in London, we would go to um, uh, we would go to an arrhythmia centre with that. Um, in South Central, don't know. <laughs> CCU or an A and E, but yeah, no, it's a blue light emergency. So fab. Okay. Second degree AV blocks, so these are the ones that confuse everyone. They confused me when I first learned about them, so I'll try not to confuse you with these, um, and hopefully some people have come across this before. So second degree just means that, uh, so first degree is delayed conduction, third degree is no conduction, second degree is intermittent conduction, if you want to think of it that way. So not all of the, not all of the, the P waves are, are, are going to generate a QRS complex, okay? So the easiest type to understand is Mobitz 1, second degree AV block type 1. It's also known as Mobitz 1. It's also known as Winkyback, German guy that 
did something about it, I should imagine. Wanky back phenomenon. Um, so AV conduction gradually increases to the point of dropping a beat is the best way of, of explaining it. And if you can see from this rhythm strip here, your PR interval is normal, longer. That's not the best group there. So normal-ish, a little bit short, normal, longer, short. You see the, 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 the pattern repeating itself. So this one here, you can actually just see it. Very short PR, normal PR, long PR, short, normal, long. That, that's the pattern you're going to see. And, and these are really, all your second degrees are going to be really hard to spot. And, and it's a really good diagnosis if you nail it. So you know, anyone that's seen second degrees out there will, will testify. When, when you first look at them, they're not immediately obvious. And, and you, do have to, you do have to really pause for a minute and say, is there something weird going on here? Look at your PR interval. If the PR interval is increasing and then you drop a beat, you have a second degree, Mobitz one. And the way we remember it, P's on the run, it's Mobitz type one. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to people. Maybe it's type one, increasing PR interval to the point of dropping a beat. And you'd quite often get these, these triplets or, or quads of, of QRS complexes grouped together because this is, this is the missing beat here. This is the missing beat here. Hopefully that all makes sense to people. So the more, the more complex and arguably the more dangerous of the two is Mobitz 2 or, or the Hay block. So Mobitz 2 um, is where the, the QRS complex is dropped at random. So, so Mobitz 1, it's, it's predictable. You'll have three normal beats with increasing PR intervals, and then it drops a beat. With, with a Mobitz 2 or Hay block, you're just going to get randomly dropped QRSs. Okay. So you can see here, you have a normal PR interval. You have a normal PR interval. You have a normal PR interval. The PR interval is constant. Okay, for all intents and purposes, these are three normal beats. And then, whoops, you've got a P wave, but no QRS. It hasn't conducted. And then it goes back to normal, back to normal. It could go on back to normal forever and again, you know, and you may never see this again. But generally, you'll see, you know, every 10th beat or every fifth beat or something, you'll see a randomly dropped QRS. That's Mobitz type two. That's the difference between the two. Again, they present with um, regularly irregular patterns because generally you'll have a block of beats together. It might be a lot longer than three. I think this is just in there to demonstrate um, how, that, how that works. So hopefully I haven't confused everyone with that. So P's marching through. We talk about the P waves are normal because they're constant. If they're marching through, P's marching through is Mobitz type two. I, I personally don't remember this one. P's on the run, Mobitz type one, and, and then Mobitz type two is the other one. <laughs> That works for me, but marching through sticks in your head, then great. Fabulous. So just a couple of other bits. So these are technically second degree heart blocks, but they, they often cause confusion because people don't fully understand them. So two to one conduction, I think, is, is quite poorly understood. So two to one conduction is a second degree heart block. All we're saying is that every other beat is being dropped. So can we tell? whether or not this is a Mobitz 1 or a Mobitz 2 underlying pathology. No, we can't because we've got no way of knowing whether this PR interval is increasing because we have a normal QRS complex there. We have another P wave, but no QRS. So we don't know what's going on. We don't know whether that's going to develop into a Mobitz 1 where you're going to see increasing PR intervals or whether it's going to have a normal PR interval and it's just going to drop at random and actually be a Mobitz 2. So with two to one conduction, we can't say just for definite what what is actually causing the problem underneath all right so so we just call it second degree heart block two to one conduction or if you just write um second degree two to one everybody will know know what you're on about all right so the av node is conducting every other impulse all right um so there, there, is, there is a bit of a rule of thumb if you were particularly interested and and it's more for for cardiology when they actually come to treat these patients to know what's going on but a moment two will usually have a wider QRS complex because Mobitz 2s normally occur in, in the context of pre-existing bundle blocks and, and ischemic heart disease and things like that. Uh, do you want to see the previous slide? Uh, that one, was it the um, Mobitz 2? Somebody asking. Diane, is that the one you wanted? Perfect. So that's a, uh, a second degree. So the two types of second degree. So um, maybe it's one again, increasing PR interval. Maybe it's two is your constant PR interval, but randomly dropping a beat. Two to one conduction is where every other beat is being conducted. Uh, every other P wave, sorry, is being conducted. And we, we can't definitively say whether it's a Mobitz 1 or a Mobitz 2 pathology underneath. So we just write it up as, as two to one. Blue light, okay. Um, so um, trust guidance that I work to is only um, 
So a third degree heart block is the only one that is definitely a blue light. It's clinical judgment. On this one, two to one conduction is likely to have a slow heart rate. They're likely to be symptomatic. They are potentially going to get a pacemaker. They're not necessarily going to go straight to the CCU or the arrhythmia center. Um, but they're going to need to be seen fairly urgently. Clinical judgment. Don't know. There's no, there's no definite answer. If they're, you know, if their blood pressure is 120 over 80 and they feel fine, then no. If their blood pressure is 60 over 40 and, and you're giving them atropine that's not working, bellus of fluid aren't working, they're passing out every time you set them up, then yes. When we discuss symptoms, should we expect the typical cardiac syncope symptoms? Yeah, absolutely. So with, with slow heart rate, you have, you have reduced cardiac output. Okay, so reduced cardiac output is going to give you syncopial symptoms, dizziness, faint, sweaty, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, absolutely. So cardiogenic shock in effect uh, with these patients. All right. One more just to do, folks, just to cover the. This is this is generally considered a type of second degree heart block, but it but it's, it confuses people, and it's it's where where the AV node is conducting fewer. So if we see in the last episode we're we're conducting for every every two P waves, we're getting one QRS complex. If it degrades to the point where actually four or more P waves are required to generate a QRF complex is known as high grade AV block. And technically, and I say technically because the trust, both trusts I do work for don't recognize this as a blue light, necessarily a blue light emergency to a, to a cardiac cath lab or, or sorry, to an arrhythmia sensor or CCU. It is treated the same as a third degree AV block. So, so a high AV block is likely to degenerate to a complete art block at any point. If you imagine what's going on here, it's have, it's taking four or more P waves to hit this AV node before it wakes up and conducts the beat. That's that's only you know one step off becoming complete art block, isn't it? And a complete art block is is then a an emergency situation. So these these patients are treated uh, pretty much as though they have third degree heart block. They're they're definitely urgent cardiology referrals. Um, uh, if if you're in primary care, they're going to hospital. If you're in the ambulance service, you're certainly going to consider a blue light. And you're certainly going to speak to your CCU or your arrhythmia center or whoever you can to get some cardiac input in that patient fairly quickly. Um, don't see it very often. I've seen one um, and we took them to the arrhythmia center, which they gladly received and, and they had a pacemaker fitted. They actually went into complete heart block um, just before they started the procedure. So it um, doesn't come along very often. Generally, you're going to see the, the complete heart block at the end of that when they become more symptomatic with your cardiac syncope that we talked about. So to finish off folks, so we've got one more case study and then the cardiac arrest rhythms, which we can go through um, very quickly. So um, you're in a GP surgery for this case, 70 year old man comes in feeling faint. Uh, he passes out in the waiting room, a crash call goes out and you go to assist. Um, you're gonna run over there, you're gonna do some basic obs. He's pain responsive, rest he is breathing. Uh, he's got a heart rate, you can't feel a radial, but he's got a, um, a, a brachial pulse. Okay, so a brachial pulse of 35. He's got an absent radial, but breathing, pain responsive. Obviously, uh, all the you know ABC approach aside, what are we thinking is, is going on here? Somebody said STEMI, uh, could be. We'll stick the ECG legs on and see what we see, shall we? So you've got a life pack thousand that gives you a little readout on the screen. So what's here? What are we seeing? So let's, let's just say that ventricular rate is 35. The rhythm strip here, if you worked it out, is actually a bit quicker, but let's say that's the, that's the rhythm we're in. We've got a pulse of 35. Um, we've got an absent radial, so we're in cardiogenic shock. Lovely, that is a big T wave, you're absolutely right. It's type three, so most people are saying third degree heart block. Okay, all I'll just point you to here is that there seems to be some PQRS association here, doesn't there? If you look at these PQRSs, the chance of three of them being identical PR intervals in a third degree heart block is, is very unusual. And now you guys are getting it well done. High grade AV block. This is a second degree, four to one conduction, high AV block. Does everybody see that now? Lovely, well done. Everybody's kind of agreeing. So I'm, I'm guessing you've got that. So well done. There is some association there. Real bugger of a, and, and this actually is, is albeit it wasn't a GP surgery, but this is um, from what I remember of the, the, the patient that I saw this in, this is pretty much how they presented unconscious on the living room floor with a very slow pulse. And, a, and a, you know, every time you sat them up, they basically died. So they, uh, they got an emergency pacemaker as you can probably understand why. So fabulous. So 
Interactive. So we've we've talked about this briefly. So your your friendly ambulance crew turn up to your GP surgery because obviously this is a crash call. You, you know somebody's phone nine nine nine. Bear with me. This slide isn't active. There we go. Have a go, guys. Where are we going to send this patient? To the nearest general A and E, to the nearest Hazu, to the nearest cath lab, to the nearest CCU or arrhythmia centre, or to the nearest trauma unit. What do we think? Do you think this patient just needs to to go to Ealing? Does this patient need to go to uh, the stroke unit at uh, Northwick Park? Does this patient need to go to Harefield Cath Lab, Hammersmith Arrhythmia Centre, or uh, St Mary's Trauma Unit? Ealing, absolutely. Uh, yeah, if anyone votes for Ealing, I'm kicking you off. <laughs> I'm sure Ealing's lovely. The people at Ealing are lovely. I don't know the building is necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Apologise to anyone from Ealing, but uh, there are better options. <laughs> Fab. Well done, folks. We've got some folks coming in now. I think my system's just being a bit slow. So, where's everyone going for? Lovely. I've mentioned it a couple of times. So, this patient is going to be treated as though they're having a a, um, a heart block. Okay. So, um, a complete heart block, shall I say. So, well done. Perfect. Next question. Uh oh. So the ambulance crew were a bit uh, were a bit quick there to get the patient up. Hello, sir. Can you walk? That's what we do, isn't it? Up, up he stands. Down he falls. And what rhythm are we going to see on the screen? What are we most likely to see with a uh, with a uh, um, a rhythm of this sort? Just out of interest, if anyone knows. Have a go. Sorry guys, this is running on a little bit. Uh, the next slide is the cardiac arrest rhythms and then we will be done. Thank you, folks. Lovely, yeah, so most of you are getting that. Okay, so generally speaking, obviously it's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of an unknown, isn't it? But generally speaking, when, when you slow a ventricle down um, to a point that it becomes unhappy, what, what you find is you get hyper, hyper excitability, if you like, of the cardiac myocytes, particularly within the ventricles. And actually, the most common rhythm you'll see when you slow a, when you really slow a myocardium, uh, sorry, a ventricle down is VF. Okay, it tends to just go all the all the cardiac myocytes go together, particularly in old hearts. Oh, what's going on? And they start to fibrillate. So you'll see a VF on the screen most likely. Okay, brilliant. Uh, pulseless VT. We're just going to talk about when my screen wakes up. There we go. So asystole, so the four types of uh, cardiac arrest rhythms. So uh, asystole, uh, and it's not always completely flat. You can still see that there's potentially some underlying uh, electrical activity going on here, but it's it's broadly flat line. It's asystole. Um, next one is is pulseless electrical activity. So where you have some form of coordinated electrical activity going on within the heart, but it's not producing a, a heartbeat. So pulseless electrical activity. Um, that's that one. So those are your two non-shockable rhythms. We'll talk about that in a minute. VF and pulseless VT. Somebody asked what PVT was. Pulseless VT. Obviously, you can have VT with a pulse. Generally, doesn't sustain all that long. But uh, I'm sure we've all been to patients that are in VT and, and you don't realise until you put the leads on. Sometimes they catch you out. Um, so VF and pulseless VT are going to get a shock. So actually, I'll just pop those up there. So non-shockable rhythms, uh, asystole and PEA. You're not going to shock those quite clearly. And new drug protocols, nice easy adrenaline, one milligram every three to five minutes. Uh, VF and pulses VT, you're going to shock every two minutes, that's really important. Uh, adrenaline, one milligram every three to five minutes, the same. Amiodrone, 300 at the third shock and a half dose, 150 after the fifth shock. Uh, check with your local guidelines though, because some trusts are, are very slightly different. Um, fab. So that was a whistle stop tour, that's your cardiac arrest rhythms. I'm sure everybody uh, that's done any kind of medical training will, will have seen these at some stage, so hopefully that's no shocker. Um, aha, pun intended. And um, and that comes to the end. So thank you guys for bearing with us. I'm sorry we're we're about 15 minutes late. Um, just took a little while to go through some of those things. So um, there's a and A session coming up. Um, if you if you don't want to hang around for that, then you're free to go. We're back next Monday, uh, seven o'clock again. We're going to be talking about access and bundle branch blocks. Okay. Um, Zoom link will go up again. We, we decided not to use Eventbrite this week just because um, a lot of people didn't get in that, that could have done last week. So um, it's good to see. 
um leave us a review please folks we we really do appreciate it obviously we're doing this for nothing we'll pop up some some handouts and things during the week on our website and, and we'll upload the video um lots of thank yous so you're more than welcome it's, it's a pleasure um to teach this kind of thing so um the uh, as always you know you can you can email us uh, webinars at stc training solutions if you've got any questions and if you'd like a cpd certificate pop an email over uh, with your uh, the name you'd like to appear and your email address i'll pop it back to you uh, it'll be done at some point this week obviously we all, we're all working full time so just bear with us it won't be instant um please please as i say leave us reviews it's really helpful it helps customers find us we do a lot of paid services in in types of training so uh, the more that, that find us and trust us the um the better it is for our business and and that means we can carry on delivering these free ultimately so um so as i say we don't want to join in on the q a feel free to go we'll see you next monday um the q a is now open you can either type questions into the chats uh yes cheat sheets uh, i've just seen um i'm going to scroll back through so hang on a minute the right q a q a you can do through mentimeter or you can um you can put messages in the chat or you can tweet us or you can whatsapp us you can do whatever you like let's get some questions and we'll hang around until um until they're all answered so let me just go through the what's just popped up if anyone's asked any questions in the last few minutes uh so okay cheat sheets yes as i say samuel i'll pop, pop a cheat sheet um up with the um uh with the the upload on our website so that'll be available same as it was last week um so galaxy a10 whoever you are by all means send us an email i'll get you a, a cpd certificate i assume you don't want the name galaxy a10 on it <laughs> see a couple of Fab. so somebody somebody's asked about zoll um, e-training we can certainly um we can certainly do something around that Lovely. See the requests for certificates are coming in already. <laughs> no, that's fine, Sienna. Don't worry. Um, Sienna, just drop us an email to uh, webinars at STC Training Solutions, and I will, um, I will get one to you. Um, Charlotte knows you anyway, so I'm sure we won't miss you. Were nice guidelines changed recently for AF? Uh, I don't think so. I think the guidelines were last updated in 2017, if I remember. I can't, I can't get to it on my screen at the moment without um, taking that off. But, um, but yes, the um, uh, I'm not aware of any recent change in in uh, nice guidelines for AF um, ash. Uh, how do levels of potassium, calcium, and sodium affect the timings of the rhythm? As in, what would you expect to see? Okay, so. Um, in terms of um, potassium, potassium will generally, um, I might, I wonder, the trouble, I can't flick back to the um, uh, thing at the moment. Um, bear with me, uh, Andrew, I will, uh, I will get back to you on that one. Uh, in high AV block, how can you tell if it's the first P wave after the QRS? Sorry, in high AV block, how can you tell if the first P wave after the QRS is a P wave or a T wave? Okay, very good. So um, effectively, it, it is just, if we can flick back to, um, oh, it's a long way back. So we flip back to this rhythm here. So you can see um, it, it's buried within the T wave. Okay, so you would expect it, sometimes it's a little bit of guesswork with these types of ECGs. Remember when I was talking about sinus tachycardia earlier and sometimes you get the P wave buried within the um, the preceding T wave. Sometimes it's just a bit of guesswork and knowing what you're expecting to see. So you would expect to see a T wave after this, okay. And somebody remarked on how high these T waves are. So what do you think that tells you? Perhaps the T wave isn't actually that high. It's just as a P wave sitting on top of it, all right. P's on T's, somebody's just put it in there. Well done, Andrew, yeah. So that's exactly what it is. So it's just a little bit of guesswork and saying, well, if, if I've got P wave, P wave, P wave, there's probably a P wave there, because there's another one there, there, there. The P waves have been regular. There's, there's probably a P wave in there somewhere, and maybe that's why the, the T wave is quite peaked. So sometimes, to, to answer that question, sometimes it, it is just a bit of guesswork. Let me get back to that, and then I can mark that as answered. 
Lovely. Uh, right, so Andrew, whilst I can go back to um, ooh, backwards, not forwards, I can go back to this. So we were talking about um, potassium, calcium, and sodium. Right, potassium first of all. Okay. So um, when you have high levels of potassium um, out, uh, outside of the cell, effectively um, you lose the, the concentration gradient um, within the cell. So less, less, so less potassium wants to exit the cell. And in effect, it brings your, um, your resting cell potential slightly higher. And when we have a slightly higher resting potential, we have an unstable cell. Because if you remember, there was, there was this kind of threshold, wasn't there? If we imagine this is sitting at about minus 80, at about minus 60 millivolts, there's this depolarization threshold. And if you're closer to that, it just means that you're going to get less um there's less difference to go sorry less distance to go before this cell depolarizes so only a slight increase in remember these cells are activated by extracellular sodium and uh, calcium if the extracellular sodium and calcium rises just slightly that might be enough to to depolarize this cell so that's what you're going to come an unstable cell all right so the types of rhythms you're going to see there are vf because this cell is just going to keep depolarizing, 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 and you'll get fibrillation. If you imagine all the myocytes doing that. So that's, uh, that's hyperkalemia. Hypokalemia, you're going to actually get the opposite. You're going to get a cell that doesn't want to um, depolarize. So you're actually going to end up with a bradycardia. because you imagine it's going to take ages for this cell to depolarize. You're going to have to wait until the extracellular concentrations of sodium and calcium are really high before this cell is going to budge. So you're going to end up with bradycardia as an asystole effectively. Uh, next one, calcium. So if you have, high, again, high levels of calcium, this cell is going to be really ready to, to, to activate. Um, so, and, and it's going to contract with a, with a huge amount of force. So again, you get unstable my, myocytes. And, and again, the reverse with low calcium. Hopefully this is all making sense. If the calcium isn't there to depolarize the cell, the cell's not going to depolarize. All right? Or with, with uh, hypocalcemia, you get kind of acute heart failure because you, you reduce contractility of the myocytes and therefore cardiac output. Sodium, sodium is going to have actually the opposite effect. So if you imagine um, high concentrations of sodium is actually going to make the, the cell um, depolarize quicker because high concentrations of sodium, extracellular sodium is going to leak into the cell. It's going to make it unstable. It's going to depolarize a lot more readily when it's going to sit closer to the threshold voltage. Uh, low sodium again is, is going to make the, the, the myocyte not want to contract. Um, in terms of rhythms, um, we are we are going to talk in in particularly in the T wave session. We talk about the effects of electrolytes. Uh, what you generally find is in these in these um, uh, when when we're doing anything to the electrolytes to make the cell less stable, um, you're you're going to see uh, more likely fibrillatory rhythms. Um, you're going to see more PBCs. You're going to see more weird and wonderful irregularities but where you're, you're making this, the cell more stable or, or more stubborn that it doesn't want to depolarize, you're going to see widened QRSs, you're going to see bradycardic rhythms, you're going to see really long QTs, um, and, and as I say, eventually you're going to see ACE study. So um, hopefully that answers your, your question, Andrew. If there's anything else you wanted me to cover, let me know. Let me just flick back to the other page, see whether anyone else has asked any questions on here. No questions from the audience. Wow. Fab, no problem. Uh, right, so um, how do we know when to rate control or rhythm control? So, um, so Samuel, not generally a, um, uh, it's not generally going to be um, a, a decision we would make. That's going to rest with cardiology that ultimately going to treat this this patient. Well, I say that I say that because actually we do make the so um, the nice guidance. Um, if if you if you have a read at that one eighty, um, nice guidance says the gold standard uh, unless a patient meets one of the the exceptions, which is a good long list on there. Basically, an older patient with with um, probably not new, like as in uh, acutely onset AF, is going to have rate control. So, in most patients that present with AF, we don't know when it started. They're elderly. They've got lots of other comorbidities. The the chances are you're going to rate control them if they need it. Because don't forget, you can have somebody present first time with AF and a heart rate of eighty, and they don't need rate control. So, all you're going to do for those is is anticoagulate them. Um, 
rhythm control is is going to be done by cardiology and that's going to be things like cardioversion um chemical cardioversion or, or pharmacological cardioversion and um ablation so ablation is generally going to be your younger patients that present with af or or patients that present with af secondary to an infection or something along those lines um so so i, I yeah you're going to get some cardiology input perhaps in those more gray area patients but if you follow your nice guidelines Generally speaking, most of your patients that present with new AF are going to get rate control if they need it, but everyone's going to get um, a NOAC or, or warfarin started at that point, unless they're you know, really high risk. Um, who else did I see? Post-MI, uh, ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers are not tolerated due to cough and edema. Would you move to an ARB? Okay, so um, the ACE inhibitor is most likely going to be causing the cough, isn't it? The ramipril cough. So uh, you would at that point move them on to an ARB, uh, Lasartan or something along these lines, and probably keep them on the CCB. So, okay, so the CCB is calling edema. I, I think my first line would be switched into a CCB that isn't so associated with edema, so lisidipine or something along those lines. If that's not tolerated, then I'd probably move to a thiazide like diuretic, such as indapamide. Uh, in those cases um all of those eventualities are covered in nice guidelines there's there's um a myriad of options there for you if you're struggling to to get somebody's bp under control because they're not tolerating but it is it is a common problem we get a lot more resistant hypertension nowadays don't we well the only reason i ask is because nice say you can manage af in primary care of appropriate absolutely actually yes, can and we do um so generally your patients that fit comfortably within the rate control um, are managed in primary care so uh, you know without without even thinking with the majority of these patients they're going to be indicated for um, anticoagulation all you need to do is is have consideration over what they're doing in life you know are they are they at risk of falls are they is their has blood score really high um, or you know are they sedentary because that's just going to affect what your first line drugs are going to be but yeah absolutely you do manage them in um, in primary care you're potentially going to refer them to cardiology if they're showing signs of of, um, of heart failure, particularly with the, the patient we talked about with a BNP of 513 is going to get a cardiology referral for echo. Um, but you're absolutely right. If you were thinking, uh, I don't know, a 45-year-old chap who's had a recent um, infection, he's been quite pyrexial for a few days, he's starting to recover from that and he comes into surgery and he's in fast AF. Um, you're probably going to think that that AF is secondary to infection. So that's probably going to be a, a, a rhythm control. So you're probably going to look to cardiovert or ablate that patient, if that makes sense. There's a bit of clinical judgment on a lot of these. And, and don't forget, you're, you're, you're never going to be alone to make those decisions. I wouldn't have thought until you become a consultant and then you'll know the answer. Any other questions? Has anyone tweeted us? Oh, lovely. Matt's, uh, Matt's tweeted us. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, we have, for those of you that are still here, we, we have Twitter. <laughs> but we, as you can see, we don't, we don't have many followers. So if you want to make us um, less lonely, please, please give us a follow and we'll, we'll put something interesting on there. Um, is SVT relevant here or another webinar? Absolutely. So uh, remember, I talked about Wolf Parkinson White very briefly earlier. We're going to cover um, tachycardias with with Wolf, Park Wolf Parkinson White. So SVT, as I'm sure you know, is a very umbrella term, and and there's lots of different types of tachycardia that that, that covers. So yes, we are. Um, it it is relevant here. Um, absolutely, everything's relevant. It's all to do with ECGs, but we are going to go into to more detail. Um, about that one at a later date. So by all means, have a little read into it. Oh, you welcome, Samuel, no problem. Yep, see you next week. Uh, have a good week. Is there a schedule? Um, Ash, the trouble is everything, I'm, I'm kind of, um, 
it's, it's a bit of a fluid schedule i'll be honest so next week is is access and um and the bundle branch blocks so i thought that would lead in quite nicely to our session on um the acutely unwell ecg effectively so we're going to look at mis predominantly um so um that's kind of where i'm going at the moment i think after that i'll probably be looking at the t wave because i think the t wave is quite relevant when we talk about acutely unwell patients as well and then we're going to look at things like tachycardias we're going to look at atrial anomalies um and and things along those lines so um they have youtube we have youtube uh yes sorry so that was in response to diane diane absolutely so sorry you can't make us uh, make it to us next week but yeah we will um we are recording these sessions um and uh, as soon as possible afterwards i'll get them up onto uh, to youtube and absolutely big emily ventricular big emily i want that to be in every handover from now on <laughs> No problem, more than welcome. Um, so I think the, the questions are drying up, so um, I suppose we'll, we'll close it off there. Um, as I say, um, uh, we can just bring up the, the uh, there we go. So again, at, at any point, um, yeah, Ash, are you gonna ask something? No problem, Matt, you're more than welcome. Uh, we'll see you next week, hopefully. In the meantime, anyone that's leaving us now, you can always tweet us, WhatsApp us, email us, do whatever you like, um, Facebook messages, whatever. If you, if you think of anything, just give us an email. As I said, if you want your CPD certificates, webinars, and I'll work through those. Um, Ash, will you look at emergency medicine ECGs in acutely unwell? So uh, I, I was predominantly focusing, I was going to focus that session on on MIs effectively. Um, was, there, was there something else you wanted to cover in that? um cardiac arrest discussion was a bit short absolutely yeah do you want us to go into more detail we can um what can we do leave it with me ash we'll we'll come up with something um if you want to go into cardiac arrest in in more detail we can um do something uh, and and in, you know put together the the um acls guidelines and and do some webinar on that that's not a problem um the issue we will potentially have with cardiac arrest management is it does vary um slightly differently between trusts particularly and and obviously depending on where you're working as well our cardiac arrest management when i'm working in the gp surgery is going to be very different for how i'm going to manage a, a cardiac arrest if, if i'm on shift on an ambulance or we're working in a and e department or something like that if that makes sense and, and obviously your skill level is going to come into that as well um but yeah we can certainly cover als and the kind of peri arrest patient if, if you like leave it with us um Fabulous. Uh, Andrew, yeah, drop me an email. Just let me know um, what certificates you want. Uh, as I say, if you drop it all into that one email, I will work through it during the week and I'll get them back to you as soon as possible. See you next week. Fab, so we'll, um, we'll leave it there then. In that case, thank you guys all for coming. I hope you stay safe and, and enjoy your week. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next Monday at seven o'clock um, for some more fun. All right, uh, that's it then. Goodbye.